Buenas tardes, Guadalupe. I see you said buenas tardes. Hello, everyone. We're just going to give uh, another maybe minute or so, maybe two minutes to see uh, if a few more people come on. One person texted me that she was in the waiting room, but for some reason couldn't get in, but it may be on her, um, on her side. So we'll see. Give me one, let's see if you want, okay, cool. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you very much. We're just give, gonna give it another minute or two to let a couple more people join. And then other people may join once we start, which is fine. Uh, a few people who registered um, told me that they normally get out of work at six or a little after, so they might be a couple minutes late in getting on. We'll give another minute or two, but we won't wait too long. Okay, no vamos a esperar mucho. Vamos a esperar un minuto, dos minutos más para que los que, que no pueden entrar hasta un poco después de las seis puedan entrar, okay? And, and then we will explain in a couple minutes the interpreting, the interpreting function, okay? Vamos a, a, este, a explicar cómo usar la función de interpretación, de traducción, okay? We'll do that in a couple minutes here. Okay, I still, I'm gonna, Cut my mic just for a second to, to uh, check with this person who's calling me because she says she can't get in. She wants to join, but it might be on her side. Give me half a second. You're on mute, Leone. So the wonderful facilitator had a great revolutionary speech, but he was on mute. You missed it. <laughs> sorry. Gosh, I'll be glad to repeat it later. Very sorry. So I was on mute. We had um, more uh, people uh, uh, signed up, but we're going to, we don't want to wait much more. We'll do like maybe another minute or so, and then we are going to start. Um, also, one of our interpreters uh, had a little last-minute uh, delay, uh, Cristal, Crystal, Zaragoza, so she might need another minute to get on so that we have both uh, Juliana uh, Ramirez, who's going to be interpreting with Somos Sur, and also Cristal, Crystal, Zaragoza. We're going to um, get to that in just a moment. Uh, so hang in there, and we're going to give another minute, and then we will start with uh, our interpreters from Somos Sur interpreting, and they will explain how to use the interpreting function. So you can go on the English or Spanish channel, uh, or if you're bilingual and you don't care, you can stay on the channel that I usually stay on. They're going to explain that. Then I'm going to do a more official welcome as to why we do these dialogues. Okay. Um, yo voy a explicar por qué hacemos estos diálogos. Y el equipo de Somos Sur, en un momento, ellos van a explicar cómo usar la función de traducción que está abajo el globito. Ahorita este les van a decir. We're going to give it about another minute here, and then we're going to um, go ahead. I see Matthew is here, one of the folks who's going to help start us off, along with a couple of comments from myself. Let's do this. We want to respect the time of those of you who got on real sharp. Uh, I will also remind you, hey, Cristal, como estas? Good to see you. <laughs> um, so we have two Cristal um, Zaragoza, so we can be in two places at once. Uh, we're going to go ahead and start uh, in a moment here with the uh, uh, Somos Sur, and then I'll do the introduction and more a formal welcome once we're sure everyone uh, can understand. We do have a few people. We actually have a number of bilingual people, just because I know maybe two-thirds of you 
Um, but some people only speak English and some people or speak good English, poor Spanish, and some don't speak a lot of English and better Spanish. So we're going to go ahead into the interpreting. So um, we're going to go now, turn it over to Somos Sur to give us an explanation of how we can use um, a, the interpretation button below. And then after that, uh, I'll start the formal welcome and we'll have some introductory remarks and then we'll begin the dialogue, okay? So vamos a empezar ahora con Somos Sur, el equipo de Somos Sur, que son las traductoras e eh, intérpretes que nos van a ayudar hoy, okay? So, so please. Gracias. Uh, Isha, do you mind sharing the slides with us, please? So, mientras Isha está compartiendo los dispositivos, eh, solamente queríamos recordarles que este esta webinar va a ser en español e inglés. Los organizadores de este evento se han comprometido a la justicia del lenguaje. So, before we get started, we just wanted to give a shout out to the organizers who've committed themselves to making this space a social justice space. Um, en un momento vamos a aprender el servicio de interpretación. In a moment, we will turn on the interpretation feature. Um, can we go to the next slide, Isha, please? The next one. Great. Right. Um, entonces, para poder crear este espacio multilinguaje, les vamos a pedir y recordar unas ciertas cosas. Una de las primeras es de que durante el evento una persona hable a la vez. So, in order to create this as a multilingual space, we're asking people to support us in the following ways. One of them is that during the event, one person should speak at a time. This allows for the interpreter not to have to choose who to interpret for. Esto le permite al intérprete no tener que escoger a quién interpretar. Next slide. Eh, específicamente si estamos hablando con un micrófono o en un lugar donde haga mucho ruido, les pedimos que hablen en voz alta y claramente. Si están ocupando micrófonos, que estén asegurándose que no estén muy cerca ni muy lejos o que estén tocando con algo. Um, so second, we're asking people, especially since we are in a, web, in a webinar setting, to please speak up, speak loud and clear. Specifically, if you're using microphones, making sure that we are not too far or too close or bumping into things. Um, next slide. También les estamos pidiendo que cuando tengan que hablar, que por favor hablen en un tono moderado para que así el intérprete pueda interpretar uh, lo mejor posible. And we're also asking people to please slow down when they're speaking and for you to speak at a moderate pace. This is going to allow the interpreters to be able to interpret at, to the best of their abilities. Um, and Asia, we can go to the first uh, slide that we had. Great. So, en un momento, Leone va a aprender el servicio de interpretación. Si usted está usando una computadora, lo que va a ver es un globo que va a aparecer abajo de su pantalla, donde tienen que seleccionar el idioma donde están más cómodos. Uh, si usted está ocupando su teléfono, entonces va a haber un icono de tres puntos donde tiene que hacer clic, después tiene que seleccionar el acceso de interpretación y después el idioma. So, once the interpretation feature is on, if you are on your computer, you will see an icon of a globe that's going to pop up. There you will select the language that you are most comfortable with. If you are on a smartphone, then what you will do is you will click on the icon that has the three dots, then select language interpretation, and then select that language that you're more comfortable with. Um, agradecemos a todos por el espacio y por la flexibilidad. And so we want to just thank everyone for the space and the flexibility. And Leone, we can start turning on the interpretation services. Gracias. Okay. So bear with me as my technical ability uh, hopefully matches the moment here. Um, give me one second. Is that okay? Does that sound okay? Who's on English? Can you hear me? Sí, okay. En español me oyen? En español sí. me oyen? Sí, okay. Perfect. Okay. So I think we can go forward. Uh, if you are having any problems, we have we have learned that occasionally, and I'm no technical uh, wizard, I'm a 
dinosaur style organizer who thought I was supposed to be running around in the neighborhoods all the time and realized I'm supposed to know something about computers in the last year or two. But uh, sometimes we have learned that it may be us. So please type in if we uh, are not able to get you into the Spanish or English interpreting. We have learned that there are some occasions where the person who's logging on, the exact software and or apparatus you have may or may not allow for the smoothest functioning of video or interpreting. So, but do let us know and we'll do all we can, okay? Um, to get everyone rolling. So I see more people have, have logged on, uh, which is great. Um, we had more folks signed up, um, but sometimes things come up. So I'm gonna start by uh, introducing myself, a number of people, that uh, that I see uh, already know us or have been on these calls before, these these um, these dialogos, these dialogues, and some of you have not. So I'll say a few things, mainly for the people who have not. I'm very happy that you made it. Uh, I know about half the people on this call, perhaps a little more, uh, which is nice. The reason I'm saying that is for those who are coming on for the first time is uh, we have never done these racial unity dialogues in this fashion before uh, September 16th of last year. So which is El Grito, the Independencia, right? The independence of Mexico, the big Independence Day. Um, uh, so let me, I'm so comfortable, but I do see a couple people that may not know me. So my name is Leone Jose Bicchieri. I'm the founding executive director of Working Family Solidarity. I'm very glad that you took time to be with us and we're gonna do um, everything we can to end at 7.30 p.m. sharp central time because we know um, we wanna respect your time. We also know a few of you may need to leave a little before then and a few other people uh, checked in with me and said they could not get on until a little bit later. So hopefully they'll be with us soon. For those of you who are not familiar, uh, Working Family Solidarity was founded about five years ago. I'm the founding executive director. We uh, uh, have, I hope we have, one of the founding board members with us. Um, I'm not sure she was able to make it. She's an ordained uh, minister, an ordained Lutheran minister who runs a uh, ecumenical community church uh, near Damon and, and 51st. Uh, it's sort of our office away from our office on the near southwest side, Reverend Felicia Campbell. She, I'm not sure if she's going to be that 805 number, but sometimes she has things she has to do with the Lutheran Church on Thursdays. The racial unity, so we founded um, ourselves about five years ago with an all Latinx and African American board on purpose. I'm the executive director, and we made sure the board was majority uh, African American. It still is today. Uh, we only have African Americans and Latinx people on our board, although we don't have a policy in place that we won't ever have someone outside of those two races or ethnicities. But what we wanted to do was start an organization that uh, our community on the west, southwest, and south side of Chicago where we work could see themselves in. So it was important to us to show that we don't need two or three really, really smart white people to get us started. And then a couple of us Latinx and African Americans could finally learn what we're supposed to do and do a good job. We wanted to send the message to our people that we know what we're doing. We're of course imperfect as all people are, but we really know what we're doing and we have the right heart to make these changes. And we think the greatest thing holding us back is that we have been trained to distrust each other, to not like each other, and to see each other as competition for scarce resources. So this was our premise, right or wrong. We never claim to know everything at all. Um, and one thing I will tell you is uh, I heard years ago that you teach that which you most want to learn. And what we teach and we really want to learn is how we can overcome the racial tension that we believe has been sown by very powerful people in our society 
to make sure that people of color, especially African-American and Latinx people, because together we're such a big part of Chicago and the United States population, so that we do not unite and we continue to fight over scarce resources. That was the premise for our founding, um, to unite low and moderate income people uh, of different backgrounds, but especially with an eye to African-American and Latinx community to fight together for equitable development. We chose to say that because although we focus a lot on labor rights, we also have learned that we cannot support working families in our fight for justice if we don't look at the threat of gentrification. So that our labor rights wins in better wages are not stripped away quickly, right, by increasing rent. Uh, and so that's what we focus on, on Chicago's West, Southwest, and South Side. I'm gonna leave a whole lot out. I will jump ahead to this. We mainly work on Know Your Rights workshops on different you know, immigration, civil rights, criminal justice, jobs, housing. Uh, but we also do the racial unity dialogues to build trust and start to come to grips with how other people have told us how we have to think about African Americans, how African Americans have to think about Latinx people. It didn't come from us. It came from somewhere else. And we wanted to start to think about who benefits when we're divided. And we felt that that would be really helpful as we struggle to fight for more housing and job rights. Uh, and I'm gonna leave out a lot of our history on those campaigns. I will tell you that normally our racial unity dialogues pre-pandemic have been done in smaller groups and in, um, in the neighborhoods. And out of those have come more concrete campaigns, what we just generally call justice campaigns to fight on very specific housing and job issues um, like Plan Manufacturing District number seven, a little west of Pilsen. So I'm gonna leave out all the details on that for, for now. Um, we started in September to do these dialogues online, originally planning to do three teach-ins or dialogues. We got such positive feedback and unfortunately the pandemic continued and so we decided to do more. I will tell you I think they are not as good for building close personal relationships and being able to get ready a campaign on the ground. That's just the truth. On the other hand, what we found is that other people that we may not know as well have joined these dialogues or many of them and have really added a lot of really rich experience. So we've continued and done something like nine since mid uh, September. With that, I'm going to show um, a couple of uh, photos from those early dialogues simply to have something up on the screen that's other than our faces. Um, can you see that? Okay, so I'm just gonna talk for like another two minutes and then we're gonna start. Uh, if Reverend Felicia's here, she will start. If she's not here, then one of our board members, Matthew Robinson will start. So these racial unity dialogues are very simply designed to do what you see, create trust, deepen our analysis of our common oppression in general, but especially tonight thinking of African-American and Latinx people, building solidarity as we struggle together for racial equality and economic justice. In our case for working family solidarity, again, that means primarily labor rights and housing rights uh, in the West, Southwest and South sides of Chicago. We talk about what does solidarity look like. And I'm just gonna go through some slides very quickly to kind of get us thinking and have some images. And these can be some of the prompts that I urge you all to pipe in on um, shortly. So what does solidarity look like? Does it mean we should like each other? Does it mean we should only understand, only respect? What exactly is solidarity? We think solidarity is organized unity, right? Not just unity, but an organized unity to get somewhere. So those are things we wanna think of. This, by the way, that's Tamika Gavin, one of our, um, our community organizer. We're moving to, um, hire another community organizer. Actually, Tamika had left that position after a little over a year. Um, what are the obstacles to our unity? This, these are all shots of racial unity dialogues we did in 2017, mm -hmm. 18, 19, and the first month or so of 2020. We obviously um, have not been doing that now. 
Leone? Yes, sir. We can't see the photos. You cannot see the photos. My goodness. Yeah. I think you have it on the wrong screen. Okay. My goodness. Can you my, share the other screen? Let me see. My, scene, my screen says you are screen sharing, but I will. Uh, you haven't opened the PowerPoint yet. What's what that? Like. It looks like the PowerPoint just wasn't open yet for us. Okay. Let me try. I will try that again. If it does not work, we'll go on without it because I don't okay. want to. I don't want to waste your time. Okay. Let me try this again. Can you see that? Yes. Now we can. I'm very sorry. Thank you so much, Matthew. Can you see that? Hold on. Can you see that? Okay. I'm so yep. sorry. Thank you so much, Matthew. So I'm going to go through this very quickly, especially now. So you've heard some of my first few comments. What does solidarity look like? Um, with one of the leaders of our women's committee, Claudia Galeno Sanchez, who I think was able to join our call today. Um, and also Tamika Gavin, who was our community organizer for about a year. She still works with us as an intern and doing a whole bunch of other uh, things, really important support. Uh, here, we also talk about the obstacles to our unity. And as I said before, please feel like these are prompts in a few minutes when we open up for more comments and dialogue for a while. Um, that's one of the main things we try. We, we again, we do not want to say we figured this all out. We have some ideas, but we urge you all to think about it. And what we found is if we don't think about it at Working Family Solidarity, we're not able to unite workers. And I don't mean necessarily just really poor workers, poor, you know, very low income, low income, and even moderate earning people, unless you're independently wealthy, you're a worker, you might earn a certain amount of money, but you can be, you can lose your job at any moment and you're a worker. Who benefits when we are divided? These are all scenes again from, from different racial unity dialogues from the past couple of years. Uh, we like to also, part of this is reflecting on our common oppression to try to learn from each other. What have African-Americans experienced? Many people who come from Mexico and other Latin American countries, if they come as adults, they may or may not know much about the history uh, of a lot of struggle from African-American people. And African-American people may not know as much about us Latinx people and what we've been through. Um, we often try to reflect, can we really view e each other as true allies? What are our points of unity? I'm going to go through these quickly so we can um, bring on Reverend Felicia or, uh, or Matthew. How do we build our unity? So how can that create power and what kind of power can that create? What would that look like? We do very concrete planning coming out of these dialogues, Know Your Rights uh, workshops. Normally, right now we're, we're doing more of a dialogue and slowly now we're able to get back into the communities and we can then build campaigns again out of these dialogues. Can we see each other as leaders? Are African Americans willing to look at Latinx people as their leader? Are we Latinos, Latinx people, are we willing to look at an African American person like in this photo, Reverend Felicia Campbell, who's one of our board members, can we look at her as a nice black lady helping us? Or can we look at her as a leader we need? We need, or we won't get to where we're going, right? So we want to study those things. The sincere dialogue helps us to analyze our situation. Uh, we believe we're taught to view each other as competitors. Do we have to continue with that? Again, learning from each other's experience. A couple more photos and then we'll, we'll end here. Can we see each other as family? Can we really be there for each other? Or is it more like, let's be nice to our neighbors now and then? Uh, we also believe our struggles are rich with victories and incredibly important lessons. But in my experience, I'm not speaking for everyone, in my experience, many times I've seen African-American people and Latinx people not necessarily know that much about our struggles. And so we really don't know where we might overlap uh, and then sometimes we actually know quite a bit and we just need to talk with each other. Last photo, um, can we raise our children? I have a four-year-old and a seven-year-old. Can I really, really raise them as much smack as I talk? Can I really raise them to see black people as like, that is our future? It's not them, that's us. How do we get there? We love and have passion for this issue, 
Um, that's why we want to keep dialoguing about it. We don't pretend to know all the answers. So uh, we're really, really psyched to have you all with us. I'm going to stop the screen share here in those. And uh, I see that Matthew Robinson is already in, who's going to offer a few uh, points to start. Uh, I just want to make sure I'm going to, I do not see Reverend Felicia Campbell. She may have had to get into her Lutheran ministerial thing that she often has Thursday evening. The person on telephone with area code 805, who is that? Asia, that person is not muted, correct? So before we move on, the person who's calling in from telephone 805, could you just let us know who you are? If you're Reverend Felicia Campbell, that'd be wonderful. I'm kind of guessing you're not. If you don't answer, we're probably going to kick you out. We love you, but sometimes we do get folks that don't love us as much as we wish they would. Um, let me try one last time. Telephone with area code 805. Could you just let us know who you are, please? Okay. Gosh, I don't think I've kicked many people out. I hate to do this. The person on 805, are you sure you don't want to tell us who you are one last time? Golly. Okay. Sorry. Um, if you are someone who really wanted to be part of this dialogue, maybe you can try coming in again and let us know who you are, but we're gonna have to remove you, okay? Thank you. Okay, so that person is gone. I know Matthew's here. The So we're gonna, when we do the racial justice teach-ins, we have a little longer presentation on very specific things, usually a longer image related presentation. When we do the racial unity dialogues, we do a little less sort of education and history. And we uh, have a few opening comments like I started and then Matthew right now, Matthew Robinson, one of our board members is gonna continue. And then we'll open it up and we can, and I'll facilitate and continue to add some comments and spur things. Uh, but after Matthew, I'll say a few words and we'll move into other people, including Matthew again, including Asia, uh, including anyone who wants to, to talk and comment. Um, but I have the great privilege of um, having Matthew Robinson say a few words and a little bit of a reflection as we move into the more open dialogue. He's a great young man, good friend of mine, a board member of Working Family Solidarity, but also um, he came to us because he believes in what we're trying to do. Uh, and we're really glad that he's part of this movement. And Matthew, please take it away. Thanks, Leonie. And um, I just want to thank everyone that's here. You're giving us your time and you know, you might be already introduced to this idea of solidarity between Black and Latino people, um, Latinx people, oppressed people, especially those of us that are, are struggling. Um, or you might just be kind of skeptical, or maybe you're just here to see what's going on. But um, no matter who you are, I just want to thank you for being here to have this dialogue with us. And um, yeah, Leone is right. I, I strongly believe in the need that the need to have solidarity between Black and Latinx people, especially here in Chicago, where both our populations are segregated from each other and from the resources that we know the city has and we know we see where it goes. So thank you for being here. And um, I just wanna say a couple of things. Um, and there are reasons why I believe that Black and Latinx people must unite in whatever ways we can, as deeply as we can, to make this country into a place where we can prosper. 
and live freely and not be oppressed. And I believe we have to work together in order to achieve that. And here's why. <clears throat> the, the first thing that we can do is talk to each other. And it's, it's such a simple thing to have dialogues with each other. And it's one of the things that we can do to open up and figure out how do we have solidarity with one another? What are the obstacles that are in front of us? I've been to several of these dialogues and one of the most impactful things that I've heard people talk about is how within their own families, they're teaching their children to not be racist. They're teaching their children to not discriminate or hate black folks, or they're teaching their children not to hate Latino people or Latinx people. And I think it's extremely powerful because especially children, they're the future. And, and they're the ones that are gonna surpass us and have the values that they learn from their experience, but they're gonna start with the foundation that we give them. And so I think that for anyone that's struggling with the idea of like, well, how do we achieve solidarity between black and Latinx folk? It's to me, the first thing you can do is if you have children or if you have family members or friends or people around you is talk to them. And if you believe in this idea of anti-racism, of solidarity, try your best to become open about it and to talk to people around you about it. And I think if we were all to do that, the impact would be really huge, especially now at the time where, you know, a lot of us are only talking to our own family members or to the people that we live with or work with and you know our social social circles are are really small so i think that that's a reason we can achieve solidarity because it's something that almost all of us can do is make those those efforts to talk to people we know about anti-racism and about how you think that we shouldn't be racist as people and that we shouldn't give those ideas to our children. And that just because we were taught that by someone older than us doesn't mean we have to be the same way and doesn't mean we have to continue doing that. So that's the first reason I think we can and must achieve solidarity. There are simple things that we can start to do. Um, the, the only thing I, I wanna say is just throughout this pandemic and even the previous year with the previous guy that was in office, we have seen that supremacists are willing to attack all of us. They're willing to, they're upset if any of us achieve any semblance of freedom or power, and they're willing to attack Mexicans, Latinx people in general, black folks, which we all saw what happened to brother George Floyd, rest in power. Um, they're willing to fight against us, sometimes violently or with the systems that you know, we are, we're trying to come to power to control. Um, white supremacy attacks all of us, regardless of whether we're black or Latinx. And that's the other reason that we must work together. We absolutely must. There's strength in numbers. There is 
incredible history worth honoring and cherishing between all of our people, despite our differences, which might be language, religion, those are huge, huge differences. But despite those, we both value pretty basic things. Dignity, pride, having a, a place to live peacefully and raise our children. And we, we both want those things. And in order to achieve them, I believe we must unite against this one force that seeks to oppress both of us. And throughout this pandemic, we saw that black folks and then Latinx folks were the most affected by the coronavirus. The most of our children passed away because of this. The most of our people passed away because of this. And so, you know, we can really see that supremacy does not value us and we must value ourselves. And we have that much more value as people if we're together. Um, so those are the two reasons I, I think uh, I remain involved with Working Family Solidarity. I'm at this dialogue. And that's why I think we can achieve unity between our people because we can do those, that first thing, just talk to people around us. And because um, we've been able to see how black folks, Latinx folks, Asian people are all under a kind of assault right now. And if we all band together, that's where our strength is. And, you know, I'd love to hear other people's thoughts on what that looks like and, um, you know, maybe the reasons why we are told to not trust each other. Maybe you're already talking about this in your families. Um, what do you think we could do? I ask you, and please speak up and um, talk to us and say anything that you need to. So thank you for being here. I'm looking forward to hearing what more people have to say. Thanks a lot, Matthew. Uh, I appreciate it big, big time. And, um, you know, I'm not gonna go back to those uh, photos that I, uh, that I put on earlier. Matthew was in a few of those. In one, he's with a young African-American woman, um, Celeste, and, two young uh, Latino boys, well, adolescents, 13, 14, Miguel and Eric. And uh, he was showing them different images of some of the symbols that African-American struggles, African and African-American struggles and Latin American and Latinx in the United States struggles have used and sort of trying to understand more about our common history of struggle and how often, whether we like it or not, uh, we've had the same oppressor, uh, oppre oppressor and we still do today, but they figured out how to approach us in similar but very slightly different ways um, to kind of make sure that we feel scared. Um, so Matthew's played a really big role. I, I did hear from Reverend Felicia Campbell, but I don't know if she she was trying to get on, but she may have had technical difficulties. I'll try one last time before we move ahead. Reverend Campbell, is is that you on the 805 telephone? She sent me a text saying, hey, is that are you on, Rev? If that's you, Rev, you're on mute. Is there anything you can do? Hold on. Let me see if I can. Gosh, I'm unmuting you. Well, goodness gracious. Reverend, is there a mute? Is there a mute function? Because I think you're unmuted from our side. Oh, that's too bad. Okay. Asia, any ideas before we move on? 
I, I, that may be her. She texted me saying, you know, I'm trying to get in, remind me of the phone number. And I did. Um, and then she got back or that number came back on, but for some reason it's not being unmuted. Goodness gracious. No, at this point, the only thing that can happen is for them to unmute themselves. Okay. Well, Reverend, if that's you on the phone saying 805, we're so sorry. If it's someone else, we're glad you're with us. We're now uh, going to open it up for more questions. I do see some, oh, someone said the caller may want to press star six. Thank you, Nurul, whoever that exactly is. We appreciate it very much. Did you hear that caller? Can you press uh, star six? Okay, well, we, won't, we won't spend a lot more time. If that person can come on at any point, that would be wonderful. It would be really great to have you. I, I believe we've done everything we can to unmute you. I'm very sorry um, if, if uh, you're having a problem. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and open it up to discussion. I, I want to say one thing. When we, again, historically, when we go back to September, we thought we had pl we planned to do three uh, racial justice teach-ins in September and October. Uh, the response from people was so strong that we decided to keep doing it. We didn't really think we could keep enough attention, especially in a Zoom call. Um, but for the first six months, we averaged probably 35 people per call from different countries, um, from Italy, from other states, and, and mainly from Chicago. So we decided to continue. And so I think we're experiencing a natural, you know, falling off from that huge number. Um, but we're very, very surprised that after our ninth, 10th racial justice teaching or racial unity dialogue, that people are still logging on. And what's really cool is roughly half uh, or a little more every time are people who are on the last one or a previous one. So we're getting a really cool mixture of 50 or 60% of people who live in neighborhoods on the west, southwest, and south sides. And I can see folks here on the screen or on the chat in the participants. Um, and then also sort of here and there getting, we've had sometime program officers, people from other organizations, um, people who uh, just heard about us and wanted to call on. One gentleman from the Kalmanovitz Institute at Georgetown University, Kalmanovitz Institute on Race and Economic Justice, an African-American brother named James Benton. Um, he and I talked some days ago and he was gonna join us and add some words. Um, and he was gonna try to get on from his uh, traveling in a car, someone else is driving, but I don't think he was able to. Um, but we've been able to get a lot of people together, not as much as we'd like to, to plan campaigns, but now we're starting to get back to that as we start to meet again in person. So really appreciate your time. Uh, three of the questions, I know Matthew re-asked them, we put in the original invitation was that you might want to talk about or something different are, what are our obstacles to unity? There is no right or wrong. This is uh, your opinion and your feeling, and you'll be respected for whatever you want to say. What are our obstacles? Who benefits when we're divided? We think that's really important to think about. Who benefits when we're divided? And essentially, what would it mean to be in solidarity with each other? Are we friends? Do we eat each other's food and know each other's culture? What does it mean to be in solidarity to build something together? So um, I invite anyone who would like to start, although I look to you, Asia, in case some people have already um, sort of raised their hands or made a comment. Definitely. Um, I think Claudia has her hand raised. So. Let me, let me, okay, Clau, give me a half second. Give me a half second because I forgot something. I'm okay. really sorry. Dame un segundito. Um, should we just go ahead and let everyone in now mm -hmm. as panelists? And that way, if you want to be seen, not everyone does, that's fine. You can undo, you can do whatever you want, but you now will basically, will kind of move from the webinar into uh, just being all together here. And Claudia, I'm sorry, please go ahead. Eh, solo quisiera hacer un comentario. Este, el tiempo que yo he estado viviendo en Estados Unidos, me he dado cuenta de que las comunidades 
de color, somos las comunidades que hemos estado más afectados en todos los aspectos. En cuanto a la vivienda, eh, a la educación, en el aspecto laboral, en el aspecto de salud, todos estamos en, en más desventajas. Y una de las maneras por las cuales, yo creo que una de las, las um, razones por las cuales estamos en desventaja es porque uh, necesitamos unirnos, necesitamos unirnos Realmente somos nosotros con la, al estar desunidos, somos nosotros quienes estamos perdiendo más y son, son otras personas um, ajenas a nuestras comunidades quienes están realmente ganando y ganando mucho. De esa manera nos están manteniendo oprimidos a las, a las dos comunidades, bueno, a las comunidades en sí en general, en las comunidades de color. Lo hemos visto, como dijo Mateo, lo hemos visto en la pandemia. Somos quienes hemos perdido a más personas en nuestras comunidades. Somos quienes vamos a perder el mayor número de viviendas. Y es todo un círculo vicioso porque nuestros niños están siendo afectados en todos estos aspectos que ya... Clau, I think you muted. Creo que quitaste el, el sonido. Quitaste el sonido. Claudia, you, you took off the, the, you took off the microphone. You muted. No te oímos. Oh, lo siento. Ah, síguele, síguele, sigue. Go ahead. Lo, lo siento, lo siento. No sé cómo pasó. Pero bueno, este, yo creo que yo creo que ya debemos de debemos de, de entender de las dos partes debemos de entender de que tanto la comunidad negra y la comunidad latina estamos estamos perdiendo al estar divididos y es hora de que empecemos a tener este tipo de diálogos de una manera más abierta para que ellos vean el tipo de, de malas situaciones que estamos nosotros y para nosotros poder nosotros como latinos poder entender más la situación de ellos y realmente empezar a empezar a, a unirnos más esa va a ser la única manera de que empecemos a ganar poder necesitamos empezar a ganar poder para ellos y también poder para nosotros porque estamos en la misma situación y si ellos no, no están mejor no ganan poder nosotros vamos a estar también en la misma situación. Entonces, estamos viendo que la violencia policíaca los está afectando a ellos y también a nosotros. Es, la violencia racial está realmente, um, no sé, están actuando de una manera bastante, bastante violenta, de una manera, de una manera muy abierta, muy descarada, muy... Y yo creo que debemos de, de empezar a tener miedo y empezar a unirnos y, y seguir con este tipo de diálogos y con más acciones, porque de hecho nosotros también necesitamos que se pase una reforma migratoria, necesitamos más este, derechos, mejor salud, mejores salarios, para, para las dos comunidades y esa es la única manera en la cual vamos a vamos a mejorar a mejorar nuestras situaciones yo creo que es todo es todo lo que lo que tenía que decir solo me gustaría algún día que podamos hacer este tipo de diálogos como lo hacíamos antes en persona eh, gracias Clau, Claudia, ¿Sí? si, si terminaste, apaga tu, tu micrófono. Sí. Pues, pues, gracias, thank you. So what, what Clau was saying um, at the end, um, you know, about 
missing the times when we could do, she was in a couple of the photos I showed earlier um, about missing the times when we did this in person. And um, it, there really is a difference, although I think we've learned that although virtual, just to be real, is not as good as in person for these dialogues, but I think we were surprised that we could really even do more than a couple of these and still have enough people who expressly wanted, like would say, when's the next one? Um, so that's been really great. But I also know what Cloud means that there's nothing like being in person and just being able to talk. So um, hopefully we can get back to that. One thing I noticed, Asia, who's, uh, I'm the, the co-host on, uh, on the webinar, she's the other co-host. I tell me if I'm wrong, but I think Tamika had a uh, written comment earlier. Yes, and I was going to see if Tamika wanted to expand on kind of what was said um, in the group. T Tamika, you wanna you wanna um, say it, or you want us to just you prefer if we just kind of read it. Um. No, I can read it and then explain because I just typed in another comment about the um, the obstacles. So basically, I was just saying that both races have trust issues. We have to actually see the two races of people coming together in order um, to believe that it's happening. Like we're just groups of people that have to see things. Uh, because of um, because of our past and what we've been through. Um, so, and I said, a number of us have been struggling with this for years. There's no doubt in my mind that we don't care for one another because we actually do. Again, I've seen um, in, in the grocery stores, Bufales, in back of the yards, where um, you can see that people are... Um, they're having dialogue about different recipes and um, letting, allowing each other to get in front of one another. So we do care for each other. It's just that it's not being, um, how can I say this? <laughs> it's just not being broadcasted. It's, that, that's a positive in the media. And so, you know, of course they wanna always um, show the negative um, but um, the obstacles would be also, um, we don't have enough diverse events in our communities that will bring people together, I, in my opinion. I mean, um, I live in back of the yards. I'm two door, I mean, two blocks away from um, Cornell Square Park when there's something going on. Uh, we, we barely know hear about it on the south end of the park. And I think it's all about everybody wanting to uh, get the message out. Everybody wanting to unify, not just, you know, certain people. So that's my take on it. Thanks a lot, Tamika. It means, it means a lot that, that, um, that you came on and shared that. Um, and Tamika has been someone who um, has been living in that area, a little south of 51st Street, um, not too far from, in between Damon and Ashland, in that area um, uh, where, you know, we do a lot of work, um, where Reverend Campbell, one of our board members on 51st Street has a, a small um, community church so slash food pantry slash after school program that has uh, mainly African-American Latinx people. And Tamika knows that neighborhood very well. She's lived there for many, many years. Um, and, and we appreciate, we appreciate you sharing. Um, and. Leona, I just wanted to jump in. Please. That Tamika had said about sharing recipes. And I, it just made me think about, um, just in general, a lot of the conversations that happen in the community, especially in the Muslim community, are around culture and how culture separates us from being able to see the other as a person, right? So a lot of the time we're just looking and we're 
we're like, oh, that person does so many things differently than I do. We won't ever have anything in common. And then once you break down all of those barriers and actually maybe start having a conversation with someone else with a different background or um, you, you know, you start to engage with them a little bit more, it comes down to something as simple as sharing a recipe and you start to realize, okay, this person also eats food. Okay, this person also uh, watches TV or does a lot of the same things that I do and it, it just makes it a little bit easier to kind of identify with that person and um, I feel like eventually down the road, since we're talking about unity, it, it unifies us. Those things that we do have in common, instead of focusing on the things that we don't know or that we don't understand, we, we start by focusing on the things that we do understand. And I was reading um, this article a little bit earlier. It's um, the title is Guide to Difficult Conversations about Anti-Blackness, but it has a lot more resources and a lot more tips in there. And the second tip that it says is harness the power of story. And I think that we underestimate just how much our experiences can help us have conversations with others or help us relate to others, um, even though some of, the nuances, sorry, some of the nuances of the stories are not going to be the same. Just starting a conversation with a story is a great way to just start the conversation. And so I feel like a lot of, especially for myself, whenever I'm in a situation where I feel like I'm not an expert, I think, oh, I can't speak up. I don't know what I'm talking about. I don't, uh, I can't add to this conversation. But um, I think that if we do focus on our own experiences and how they relate to the bigger picture, then you always have something to say. So harnessing the power of the story is just the first step and like the easiest way to, to start having these conversations with others. So I'm gonna share some of the resources that I found a little bit earlier in the chat, just in case anyone wants to kind of look and see what I was talking about. But Tamika, thank you just for reminding us that something so simple is a great way for us to connect with others. Yeah, thanks a lot, Asia. Yeah, no, that's, I appreciate it. And I, and I appreciate what Tamika is saying. I know that exact food for less <laughs> um, that you're talking about. And I hear you. Um, one of the things I, I wanted to just check on is I wonder, I'm feeling like that 773 number is Reverend Felicia Campbell. Um, I'm feeling like that's your cell phone, Reverend. Um, can you hear us, Reverend? Are you possibly on mute? I think I let you. There okay, you I'm open now. I'm Yay. here. Hey, let me, you, now you have to bear with me just for 30 seconds, please, um, while Go I ahead. introduce you. To be in late. No, ahead. no, pr no problem. Let me just quickly tell or tell people. So um, Matthew Robinson, who spoke earlier, for a while, I'm not sure he was able to, to stay on much longer, but Matthew is one of our uh, board members. Another of our board members is Reverend Felicia Campbell. Uh, I talked a little bit about her earlier. She was in a number of those photos I showed. But again, you know, when we started, the majority of our, well, all of our board was either African-American or Latinx, slight majority African-American. Uh, still today, slightly, slight majority African-American and a few Latinx people. Uh, and Reverend Felicia Campbell's been one of the great ones. I met her probably 10, 11 years ago, and I was impressed because she was working with Latin American, la with Latinx youth, kids and youth in an after-school program, and African Americans. And I just thought the way she helped them not shy away from talks about the racial tension that sometimes exists between our people, but also really was able to help people get over it at the same time. And I was just really impressed. And I'm glad I said hi to her about 11 years ago. Um, and Reverend um, Felicia Campbell, if you'd like to say uh, any remarks on this issue, that'd be wonderful. Thank you so much, uh, my big brother. I apologize for being so late. Um, I am just, I don't know the words to say, but I don't like how America is trying to uh, separate the African Americans and the Hispanics and the Puerto Ricans. I, I'm, I'm tired 
of hearing that. And this week I heard something that really disturbed me. Uh, it was on one of the newscasts. I don't know if it was an alderman or who it was, but the young man said, uh, we are Hispanic and uh, we're going to get what we want. And somebody mentioned, the reporter said, well, what about black and brown people? He says, well, the black people had their chance. Now it's our turn. That disturbed me because neither one of us have turned. And we're all still trying to do the right thing. It was, uh, he was referring to housing. And so I, I am just very disturbed about it. And I asked. I said, well, God, when is this going to stop? We have to stick together. And I hate to use this as a, an example, but if the white people could stick together fighting us, we can stick together staying strong so that we can also pull through and do and get what is right and just for us. And so we have to stop fighting each other. We have to stop looking down on each other. We have to stop talking about each other. And we have to come together. And I don't know what we have to do to come together, if it has to be a rally every month or it has to be some type of uh, talk uh, to various families. I don't know. But I want us to get together. And we need to do it soon. Of course, prayer is always in order. And I want everybody to pray, but I want to find out what we can do to come together because it's urgent, because the Republicans, they don't care who they hurt. They don't care for the african American, they don't care for the Hispanics, they don't care for the Latinos. They, they don't care for nothing but what they want. They want the separation because 50% of America is... is is white right now, but it's dwindling. And so they're fighting for their lives. And so we need to fight for our lives. I don't want to see us go back in slavery and all that other stuff. We need to come together. If we had to have a, 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 a combined concert or a combined worship service, it's something we have to do to get together. So I'm going to be quiet and see what the Lord has to say on how we can actually make that happen. But in the meantime, we have to talk to each other. We have to work together. We have to love each other. And we cannot talk about each other. We can't do that. Because remember, we're still color. We are people of color. And you may be lighter than me, but we're still people of color. And they say that. And they use that to get us. So let's pray and see what we can come up with so that we can actually bring each other together because that statement that that young man made disturbed me so bad. I said, no, you can't turn on us because we we the same people. We just from a different country, but we're still color. So that's all I have to say. And let's see what we can do about that. Thank you very much, Reverend Campbell. Um, yeah, and, and I know from experience that you have not only ideas about what to do about that, but I've seen you in action. and. As I said before, I've been impressed and I would like to try to be able to do that if I can, but the way you've handled young people and kids of African-Americans and Latinx kids, and somehow you're able to really strongly confront this issue when you hear them calling each other names and everything. And yet somehow you, 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 like you keep them near, like they don't, they don't, run away from you because you have this great love for both of them but you say what's up uh, and I think they respect that and you'll challenge them like where'd you learn that that name who taught you that name right uh, what, what are you talking yeah. about but but you don't do it in a way that says like don't ever come back here but you go no 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 come even closer come even closer because now together we have to figure out why do you think those things and you're only eight years old um and right. I, I just think that's a real challenge for us because I have two little kids, man. Man, I've never been so careful about anything I say, any way I look at anyone, because I'm so afraid that I will, you know, teach them something that I don't want them to learn. Every time we give our little daughter, seven years old, a doll, right? 
um, or get a doll from someone that we can't then decide and we don't want to get all the light skin dolls right um, mm -hmm. and so when we get them do we give it back to the person or do we then quickly buy another <laughs> dark skin one but we have to be really conscious of those things because those those really sh uh, really shape our kids future and that is very important we definitely have to watch what we say to them because that's what's wrong with the white population. They've been told all their lives that we were all nothing and poor and this, that, and the other, and they were supreme, and it's in their head, and they actually believe it. And so we really have to really talk to our children. That's where it starts, at home. That's a good point, Leo. I think there may have, thank you so much, Reverend. You know, I mean, you, you could do this whole thing on your own for two hours and we'd all still be here. Um, I do want to check because I think we've had some different comments in the chat box from various people. Um, what do you think, Asia? Are there some that we could read or do we want to see if any of those folks want to say it or should we just read it? Um, yeah, I actually wanted to, talk, um, to check in with Adriana. She had her hand raised for a little bit. I don't know if you still wanted to share, Adriana. Hello. Hi, everyone. It's good to see so many of you on tonight. Um, I wanted to take a moment to uh, reflect on this one year anniversary of George Floyd's death um, and talk about what a pivotal time this has been for us as a country. Because one of the things that I do uh, want to acknowledge is that we we did start to see some shift with uh, folks standing up for each other and understanding that the fight with the African American community was also our fight because we are also being killed and targeted and um, you know oppressed in so many ways. And so there, there has to be some way where we remind people, um, and that's through community organizations, through your own home and, you know, your daily dialogue um, and how you frame um, people. I know, in, you know, I've experienced it even in my own family where, you know, you're being judged by the color of your skin, even in the Latinx community, you know, where there's, oh, well, you're darker. Oh, that's the, you know, and they'll use terms like, oh, negrita, or, you know, something along the, where it, it's, it, it, there's an, in, um, sometimes it's intentional, and sometimes it's unintentional, where you are um, putting somebody down in a way, just solely based on the color of their skin. And so I just want to at least acknowledge that uh, there have been some strides, especially in this past year, as hard as it's been, as much civil unrest as there's been, that actually is the good work going into motion. And if you look at it even through, you know, employers, through um, various uh, um, higher education uh, institutes, it's become such a, an important um, aspect of what folks are doing because they recognize that these problems are, they're, they're big and they're ingrained and they're happening to us in our everyday life, whether that's in our neighborhood, at the store, you're getting pulled over by a police officer, um, you're going in for a job. There is an oppression for the group of us as a whole and we're not going to get anywhere unless we start leveraging that power and coming together to look for solutions look for better wages more opportunities there are, there is so much work to be done and i can't emphasize enough that that work starts at home and so every day the way that you are with your family hold people accountable call it out be the first one to say no actually we shouldn't use that term that's 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 actually not respectful and that's not where we are and try to come up with a way of and leona you're spot on about asking questions what makes you think that you know this person is bad what makes you believe that this community is out to get you um 
you know, there are a lot of kind of stereotypes that we just follow. And so I just, you know, I can't say it enough and, and more wholeheartedly that we can, we can talk and we can have events and we can do all these things, but it has to start at home. And we have to look for other people who are allies to create that unity and to continue moving the conversation forward. It's not gonna happen immediately. It's not gonna be easy. There will be hurt feelings and there will be people who um, aren't in alignment with it, but you gotta keep just, you know, setting your course and making sure that you are living your um, true self, you know, acting on those principles of diversity and equity and justice. So that's, that's just my two cents. We need more two cents like that. Um, and those are great, great points. Um, um, it actually, some of what you said at the end about um, allyship and um, just taking action puts in mind a comment that Neural shared earlier I'm just going to read it. Uh, solidarity includes recognizing our common experiences and interests so that we can more, effect, more effectively take common action. And so it comes down to, um, you know, figuring out the ways that we can do the things we know how to do. And that may mean um, doing those with others where allyship comes into play. And I saw this quote earlier that said, we become stronger with allies, but we don't become weaker without them. So already um, in our communities, we have a strong front, but just imagine how much stronger we can become once we partner with our allies and kind of move forward from there. I just want to add to that. That's a great point. Um, there's a lot of statistical data that tells us that, you know, we would be stronger together, right? We're, we're all these kind of lower class, blue collar working people, we're fighting for jobs, we're trying to, you know, just survive, pay our rent, you know, put food on the table. And there's, there, there's been this narrative that's been created that instead of you looking at the system, you looking at the people in power, we're looking at each other and we're trying to knock out the guy next to us because that's the competition and that's who we need to hate. It is such a, a, a crazy and longstanding um, oppressive system. And, you know, we need to, to look to each other more as, as those, those allies and, you know, understand the true power in sheer numbers that's going to take us forward. Yeah, one of the, one of the things that that uh, I mentioned earlier, but one of the things we like to talk about at Working Family Solidarity is why do we, why did we put the term solidarity in our name? And I mentioned this before, um, and there could be other really effective definitions as well, but one of the ways we think about solidarity is it's organized unity. So, so not just we're together because it's good to be together, although that's a wonderful thing. That's a, that's a good enough reason. Uh, we're all human beings and to understand each other and, and like each other, have affection for each other. It's probably the highest moral, um, you know, step we can, we can take. Uh, but in the meantime, for the single mom or not necessarily single, getting up at four or five in the morning, gets home at 9 PM, long commute either way, tucks the kid to bed, goes to sleep. For that person, he or she, usually she, uh, maybe doesn't have time to figure out and how to sort of be a friend of all the folks who are not exactly of her race or ethnicity, but similar, are a person of color, a worker of color. And so we talk a lot about, we do think it's right to, to develop that love. But in the meantime, there's also a lot to be said for strategy and for using our brains. And so I think the two can go naturally together. We should absolutely value each other. Um, as physical anthropologists remind us, 
there aren't two or three or four races of people. There's one race, ultimately. We use race as a social construct. So different cultures and, and nations have different ways they mean when they say a race. But technically, we're all homo sapiens sapien. There's not two types of people on earth right now. Um, you know, there's just not. Neanderthal, Cro-Magnon, they may have overlapped by 10 or 15,000 years, but we're all the exact same human. We all came from Africa, like it or not. I think it's cool, but if you don't like it, it doesn't matter. These are scientific facts. We all come from there. That's where life started as human beings, and we all grew from that, and then people developed a little more hair if they were more north because of the cold, and we all developed these different characteristics, but there's only one human race and race is a social construct, and it's not constructed by any of us on this call. It's constructed by really powerful people who are generally born wealthy. They don't earn it. They're born wealthy, and they continue this myth, right, um, that we all buy into because, like Adriana said, if I don't buy into that, you know, hey, Leona, that's a really cool, fancy thing you said on that on that call the other night, all I know is I'm here at four in the morning at elite staffing at 55th and Kedzie in Chicago. There's 10 Latinos and there's 10 black folks and there's 10 people that can get on that van to go to work today. And I'm going to be one of them. And if the supervisor's Latino and I can speak Spanish to him, and I've personally seen this hundreds of times at four in the morning at that exact place I mentioned, then I'm going to use that advantage and hope the guy's from my home state of Mexico and hope to God he lets me get on that van. And I'm really sorry those 10 black guys couldn't get on. But you know what? It's them or me. And we are tricked into thinking it's a zero-sum game. And so we fight, we duke it out all the time. Same with housing. I'm going to get that Section 8 voucher before those black folks get it because I deserve it, right? I'm an immigrant. I've worked hard. Or the black person saying, these folks aren't even U.S. citizens, right? And then when we learn where we really come from, we go, good God, our histories are so similar. I tell a lot of Latinos who tell me, and I appreciate their honesty, we work together in the communities, and they'll say, hey, man, those black folks got it made because I'm undocumented. I don't qualify for food stamps. I don't qualify for unemployment. I have to work even if they don't pay me minimum wage. And they'll get angry at black folks, and I'll tell them, you know, one thing to think about, is do black folks really have the power to oppress us? So let's take out emotion for a minute. Do they really have all this great power in this society? No. Plus, we can learn so much. I'm, uh, this is how I talk to a lot of Latinx who are like, man, this thing about solidarity, that's yeah, whatever, man. Let's worry about our own people. What I challenge every person on this call to think about, who is your own people? Who is your own people? Because in my life, I used to think it was all, all Latinos until I learned a whole bunch of Latinos tricked me. And some folks from other ethnicities, including some black folks, were there for me. So who really is my people, right? And I'm tricked to thinking it was folks that spoke Spanish like me, had a certain culture like me. Then I realized that's my culture, but that's not all of me. That's not the need I have to pay rent. So I think we have to, in Working Family Solidarity, we really urge people, not that we know, but we urge to get into this conversation, the notion of working people, not just rich people and not just poor, poor workers, but low, very low, low and moderate income wage earners that are almost all of us in this country. And the more we can see through this scam, right, of we are so different, um, it's, uh, we're not that different at all. But if we figure that out, we're gonna cause these wealthy people to get really scared. So you know, we like to inject that. And that's why we call ourselves working family solidarity, even though we work so much um, to destroy race. Uh, and the whole issue of, of this sort of racial, racialization, not just racism, but the racialization of everything that happens in society and start to look at it more as economic um, income and how we can unite on that. We do have a few more minutes. And I don't know if, um, Anyone would like to say something or chat something or? Puedo, puedo hacer otro comentario? Uh, yes, puede, sí, yes. Este, yo, yo solo este, estaba pensando, me estaba acordando desde que llegué de México, siempre me decían que los barrios negros son los barrios peligrosos. Entonces, 
Um, fue, lo, fue lo primero que yo escuché, que era, no hay que acercarse tanto allá de noche, y este, no hay que, más bien no hay que, no hay que ir para esos lados. Entonces, um, se va uno creando la, la mentalidad de que no, no quieren trabajar, de que son peligrosos. Um, y después, con el tiempo me he dado cuenta de que, de que realmente a nosotros también como latinos nos tratan de la misma manera, que somos, somos flojos, somos um, peligrosos, so, y, y realmente nos, nos tratan con la misma violencia, con el mismo desrespeto, con la misma opresión. Eh, yo lo veo como que es una manera de esclavitud, un, un tipo de esclavitud. Eh, eh, por eso es que me gustan mucho estos diálogos, porque yo aprendo mucho de, de ustedes, de, los, de lo que escucho, y me doy cuenta de que hay más personas que piensa que se están dando cuenta, que se dan cuenta de las cosas, pueden ver la realidad y realmente eso nos ayuda a nosotros, um, especialmente a nosotros que estamos viniendo de otro país, a darnos cuenta realmente cómo son las cosas aquí y como dicen ustedes, como sabemos quiénes son realmente los beneficiados, los beneficiados no somos las comunidades de color, con toda esta división, este odio racial. Y, este, y afortunadamente nos han, este, eh, han estado participando personas hasta de otros países y nos sentimos, la verdad, yo me siento como menos sola, siento como que no soy la única persona que estoy en desacuerdo en todo este tipo de, de sistema de opresión. Gracias, Clau. Thank you. Apa, eso, ajá, apagó su micrófono. Was some, did someone else, we still have a few more minutes. Would anyone else like to, or maybe there was already a chat uh, comment? I think Christine had a response. Okay. ¿Puedo comentar algo al respecto? Sí. <laughs> es Hola, Miralda. buenas tardes, Leone, ¿cómo están? Bien, es, gracias. Qué bueno. Eh, pues yo pienso que no nada más es el racismo entre, como siempre nos han hecho creer que el racismo es entre los morenos y los, hacia nosotros los latinos. Yo creo que también nosotros los latinos de alguna manera somos racistas a veces nada más en la calidad de que, de cómo nos expresamos a veces de los morenos. Pero también los morenitos son racistas con nosotros por el simple hecho de que piensan que, este, que no que no nos podemos defender a veces por el idioma, quieren como, como sentirse superiores a nosotros. Yo lo he vivido ya dos veces aquí en mi barrio y no sé cómo, cómo hacerle para que, para, hacer, para que ellos sepan que no somos menos que ellos, somos iguales. ¿Eh? Esa es mi opinión. Gracias. And uh, I appreciate you saying that. Because, and again, I think it probably functions even better in person, kind of smaller private groups um, where people feel like they can say something that may or may not be sort of politically correct. But we're going to all have to talk about how we really feel, not just what we've learned we should say, um, but because we're all, we're all trained to see things in a certain way. And we have to talk about those things to come to some agreement on how we're going to kind of move forward. And I appreciate Esmeralda, you know, saying that she feels there's been times when she's had some tension. I know Esmeralda very well. I know the area she lives in. It's an area, uh, I think, when she moved on to uh, 54th Street, about a block east of Halstead, they're the only uh, non-African-American family on the block. So, you know, a lot of interesting issues came up, not easy issues, right? But they're the right issues to talk about. Um, I don't know if uh, anyone wanted to not necessarily respond to what she said, but kind of come off of that comment and, and say anything else. We're, we're going to end here in just a few more minutes, but I don't know if anyone had any other comment related to that or, or different. Christine? Okay. 
Yes, thank you so much. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to say that um, one of my um, learning things, something I've experienced is that I think the hardest thing is to look at yourself and, and realize that there are things that you have to work really hard in your internal conditioning and things that you've learned versus sometimes thinking that it's the other person that needs to change. Um, and I've, you know, fought a lot with this within arguments and discussions within my own family, but um, just realizing that we have to forgive people, like for, say, for instance, like a, a specific something that's happened to us in the past and, and look at ourselves and say, is this something that is, is I can apply this to a whole group of people or, or do I believe this way? because of just one experience or am I forming my opinion because somebody else had this experience and I'm just taking their word versus me actually you know feeling discrimination or or feeling a certain way about somebody because it's just something I heard from someone else and I think that's probably um, one of the hardest things is to look at yourself and and not be forgiving of yourself and realize that you know you you may need to change and it's okay if you're wrong um, and it's like no judgment against you, but just as long as you're trying to be better and work, um, you know, for to be better and help other people. Um, but yeah, the judgment I think is is probably um, the hardest part. Thank you very much. Really appreciate it. Very much, very much. I know we're we're at seven thirty. Um, is there? someone that wanted to add something else um, we could take another minute or two we will we will end here in a moment but any other thing before we close up obviously not a topic we're sort of going to finish tonight and obviously we've done this many times and i know many of you have as well um, but if anyone wanted to say anything else before we close well Thank you very, 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 very much. Um, and like I started by saying, and I'll repeat, it's one of my favorite phrases uh, in the movement, which is that you teach that which you most want to learn. Um, we're not professing to teach, but we keep going on this subject because we think it's a, sort of like an alcoholic who gets up in an AA meeting and says, even if they hadn't, have not had a drink in 25 years, do you know how they start? I'm so-and-so and I'm an alcoholic. And I, uh, uh, we at Working Family Solidarity think there's something to be said for something similar where we, where we get up in the morning and say, you know, I'm Leone and I'm a racist. Not, and because I think that's cool, even if I'm disgusted, but a little bit like you were saying, Christine, I think we have to, there's nothing wrong with admitting that we are formed by society. We can't be one person in a society of 350 million people and think, even again, within Latino culture, like I think some people were saying, right? Um, we often talk about, you know, I'm a lighter skinned guy. My dad's from Italy, right? Uh, and so, um, you know, when I was growing up, there were adults who would tell my mom, you're really lucky because your three sons are kind of lighter skinned. And um, you know, because then maybe we wouldn't have as many problems and stuff. So it's understandable in some ways, right? But at the same time, we all have to fight that. I've had to try to fight that in myself, right? I went to college. I'm a lighter skinned Latino. So what? Um, if my community has not advanced, I've done nothing and I should be ashamed of myself. But in, unless we form these communities of support to each other, we will not stay true to what our whole community needs, right? Of, of working people, especially working people of color, because we're gonna drift into that individual success that we think we can find when in reality, um, Cesar Chavez, the head of the big United Farm Worker Movement in this country, and I worked in that movement for 10 years, and he used to say, if our community has not come along with us, we've done absolutely nothing. And I hope we can all really try to think about that in the different ways we go forward. We'll be in touch. We'll follow up about our next racial unity dialogue, or it may be a racial justice teaching. And we really greatly, greatly appreciate that everyone was here. 
Asia, <laughs> co-host, thank you so much. Matthew Robinson, thank you so much. Reverend Felicia Campbell, thank you so much. I know a lot of the other people here, I'm not gonna go all the way down the list, but we really, really appreciate everyone being here. We wanna say thanks to Somos Sur, right? We are the South, Somos Sur, the interpretation and, and you know, a team that did a great job. Uh, Crystal, Cristal Zaragoza, and uh, Juliana Ramirez, thank you very, very much. And wishing you all a great, great evening, and we'll uh, be in touch with you about next time. Thank you so much for being with us. Have a great evening.